Thank you. Well, I'm uh, very pleased to be here with you. And uh, I'm going to be talking about how new things happen. Uh, the laser is one of the examples. Uh, how do new things happen? How do, we, how do we bring about new things? How do we invent new things? Well, uh, many discoveries occur by, by accident. But the accidents are generally as a result of very careful investigation and thought and so on, uh, and exploration, willing to try new things. Some of them occur by careful exploration. You, people try very hard to discover a particular thing, and finally, uh, after a lot of hard work, uh, it's discovered. Now, most discoveries also involve an interaction between different fields and interaction between different people. People exchange ideas and you learn things from them and fields interact and uh, uh, something new frequently occurs as a result of a new interaction of uh, two different ideas coming together and so on. Uh, in a way, the laser was, was part of that, uh, that, that kind of picture. <coughs> Uh, but it was also a result of careful, uh, directed, and purposeful uh, exploration. But now, <coughs> let's think of some of the accidental. But now, <coughs> let's think of some of the Columbus. Columbus, of course, wanted to go west and uh, get to India and China. But he didn't do that. He got to the, got to the, a, a new completely new part of the world, nobody knew. And of course, that's why the people here were called Indians. <laughs> a little different from those that he was looking for, uh, but he just had something new. But he tried, you see, he took a, he took a big chance, uh, and really uh, great plans and uh, great effort, to, uh, and, and look what he discovered. Well, now I might also mention the discovery of the transistor. That was uh, discovered by a friend of mine at Bell Telephone Laboratories, <coughs> Walter Bratton. He was uh, just examining semiconductors, uh, examining copper oxide and so on. He found something peculiar. He couldn't understand what, what the effects were he was measuring, but he, he recognized it was something unusual. And he went to John Bardeen, who was also at Bell Labs, a theorist, and said, uh, John, you know, what's, what's going on here? I don't understand it. And John looked at it and thought about it for a while. And, uh, Hey, you've got amplification. Did you realize that? No, he didn't realize he had amplification. He got, you've got amplification. That, that was a semiconductor amplifier. That was a new amplifier, new kind of amplifier. Well, Bill Shockley had actually tried to, tried to make such a semiconductor amplifier a year or two before that, and he was their boss, so he jumped into the business too. <laughs> and, uh, and so the three of them got the Nobel Prize together. Well now, then there was a discovery of the Big Bang. One of my f former students, Arno Penzias, uh, had uh, worked with me in trying to, trying to um, uh, pick up a particular spectrum out in space using microwaves. And uh, he went to Bell Labs after that and he worked again some more on it with Bob Wilson. And they looked and looked. They didn't find that spectrum, but they found uh, some continuum radiation, a very weak continuum radiation. Now, he found that as a result of having a maser amplifier. He'd worked with me, uh, with me on masers, and masers were the most sensitive amplifiers. They used a very sensitive amplifier, so it could detect this radiation out there. That was the origin of the Big Bang. The Big Bang was discovered by accident, the how, how the universe began. The universe began, with, a, and this was a remnant, remnant of the beginnings of the universe that they discovered, accidentally, you see. Uh, well, now, um, if you um, think of the maser and the laser, well, that came about not by, by accident, but by a hard effort on my part. I was... Uh, <coughs> I was using microwave amplifiers uh, to study molecules. How did that happen? Well, again, by accident. I, was, uh, I went to Bell Labs to do physics, but war was coming along, World War II, and they signed me to do radar. Oh dear, I had to become an engineer. But I learned a lot from that, which was very important. 
I'd become an engineer, so I learned a lot of microwaves, microwaves and amplifiers and so on. And um, after the war, uh, after doing radar, we could, uh, I worked on radar, the shortest radar at the time, one and a quarter centimeters, and um, that was getting more directivity. Uh, but it didn't work because it turned out that water vapor in the atmosphere absorbed that wavelength. Water vapor absorbed the wavelength. Oh dear, so the whole thing was ruined. Uh, well, one mistake frequently leads to success because I said, well, I'll just study this water vapor in the laboratory a little bit and see what, how it absorbs and so on. So with microwave oscillators, I studied the water vapor. I said, wait a minute, it looks like we can do a lot of good spectroscopy. So after World War II, Bell Labs let me do spectroscopy on molecules with microwaves. And that was very exciting. And I found a lot of things we could measure measure the shapes of nuclei, the spins and their shapes and so on, and that became so important I was offered a job at Columbia University. Well, I always wanted to be in a university, so I uh, offered a job at Columbia University, and I went there at Columbia University, and I worked on some more. I wanted to get on down to shorter wavelengths. <coughs> Us microwave oscillators at that time could be made down to wavelength of about a centimeter and maybe a little bit shorter, but not much more. I wanted to get on down to shorter wavelengths down in the infrared, below a millimeter if possible, and so on. How to do that? Well, I worked, I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I had my students try various things. They didn't, didn't work. And then I was appointed chairman of a national committee by the Navy. The Navy was interested in getting the shorter wavelengths, too. I was made chairman of a national committee to find out how we could get the shorter wavelengths. And I formed a group of very famous scientists and engineers and so on. We traveled all over the country trying to find any, anybody had any ideas. After a year's time, we decided, no, no, no ideas. And so we had our last meeting in Washington, and we we're going to write a report saying, sorry, we couldn't find out anything. I waked up early in the morning, worried about it. I went out and sat on a park bench, and oh dear, why we hadn't been able to get any ideas? I said, well, of course, molecules and atoms produce short waves. But you can't get more than a certain amount of energy without heating them up enormously. You heat them up enough, then they fall apart. And so I said, well, well, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We don't, we don't have to define them with a temperature. I can get more, maybe I can get more molecules in an upper state than in a lower state and uh, get a lot of energy from them, amplify. Oh, and I wrote, wrote down some equations and uh, pulled out a piece of paper in my pocket and wrote down some equations. Looks like maybe it might work, but it was quite doubtful. So I didn't bring it up with the committee, and we wrote our report saying, no, sorry, we don't have any ideas. I went back to Columbia University, figured out some more, and decided, yes, I'm going to try to do this. But I'll try to do it first at microwaves, because I had some microwave equipment, see if I can get molecules to amplify in microwave frequencies. <clears throat> well, um, I got a student to work with me, Jim Gordon, do his thesis on trying to do this. The other way to do it is using molecular beams. As, uh, now, uh, at Columbia University, they originated work on atomic and molecular beams and trying to study the properties. And I knew to send a beam, deflect it with, uh, electrically, you can deflect the beam so you get the upper states one way and the lower states another way. You can get all the, upper sta get all, all, all the molecules in the upper state then. In the upper state, then they can fall down and amplify. Oh, okay. Well, I had been working on ammonia. I thought, well, I'll use ammonia and I'll do this. And uh, Jim Gordon worked on this. He'd been working on it for a couple of years. And <clears throat> Professor Robbie, who had a Nobel Prize, and Professor Cush, who got a Nobel Prize soon after, and Robbie had been chairman of the department. Cush was then chairman of the department. They came into my laboratory and said, look, that's not going to work. You know it's not going to work. We know it's not going to work. You've got to stop. You're wasting the department's money. You've got to stop. Well, fortunately, I was an associate professor by then. They couldn't fire me. <laughs> you can't fire an associate professor unless he does something morally wrong. You can't fire him just because he's stupid. So uh, I knew they couldn't fire me. I said, no, I think it has a chance. I'm going to continue to work. Well, they marched out of my laboratory angrily. About three months later, Jim Gordon came into my classroom and said, hey, it's working. It's working. So, oh boy, all of my students, we went out of the classroom, went back to the laboratory, the other thing was working. Yes, a new kind of oscillator using molecules to amplify. And it was working in the microwave region. 
and I got together with my students to pick a name. We thought, well, we decided to choose the name MESA for Microwave Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. That is, a molecule was stimulated by radiation to give up the energy, so they gave up the energy and amplified some more, and that was microwave amplification by stimulating emission radiation. That was a measure. Well, that became very exciting. Nobody, uh, we worked on this in the laboratory for about three years. A lot of people came by and said, oh, yeah, well, okay, but nobody competed. Nobody was interested, nobody competed. Once it got working, oh, well, it was exciting. Then everybody jumped in the field, and there was lots of work, particularly in universities. I'm, I'm sorry, particularly in industry. Industry then began to hire all the students who'd worked in the field because they were interested in these amplifiers. This gave the most sensitive amplifier in the country, or most sensitive amplifier we ever had, new kind of oscillators, very pure frequencies and so on. So industry got interested in the hot field. Well, <clears throat> pretty soon I took a sabbatical leave and went to Paris. Took a sabbatical leave uh, and uh, went to Paris so I got to get a bit of change change and so on. So, And in Paris, one of my former students was there. He was in, I worked with him in École Normale Supérieure. He uh, had found that electrons in a magnetic field, electron spins could be made up and they would stay there for a while. Uh, electron spins normally fall back down. They can be up in the magnetic field, they fall back down pretty quickly. He found material in which they stayed there for some time, and I said, hey, wait a minute, look, if we can get them to stay there for a while, maybe we can get them to amplify. We can amplify with electrons in a magnetic field. We can, tune, we can tune them by changing the magnetic field so we can pick frequencies. Oh, well, that was exciting, and we, uh, we worked on some. We published a paper. Then Nico Bloomberg and at Harvard read our paper, and he, uh, he'd been working on electron spins, but two electrons joined together. Now, two electrons joined together, instead of having two states, an upper state and a lower state, they have three states, here, here, and here. So Nico recognized, well, you could excite them by pumping them from here up to there, and then they could fall back down to there and amplify, and that was a, a so-called three-level three -level maser. And, uh, that was, a, that was a great discovery, too. And uh, <clears throat> now, uh, also while I was in Europe, uh, I known O. Bohr, the son of Niels Bohr, uh, well. Uh, Niels Bohr, of course, very, uh, maybe the most famous physicist of his time. And uh, so I went to visit the un uh, O. Bohr up in Denmark, and I was walking along the street with Niels Bohr, that I was just delighted to meet. And, get acquainted with. He asked me what I was doing. I told him, I told him, well, we've had this oscillator using molecules and it's a very, very pure frequency. He looked at me and said, oh, no, no, that's not possible. No, that's not possible. You must you misunderstand. I'm sure he was thinking of the uncertainty principle. You see, the molecules go, went through a cavity at a certain length of time and uh, you can't define the frequency better than one over the length of time that goes through the cavity. And he, he knew that. But he didn't recognize we were using a collection of molecules, not a single one. So the uncertainty principle didn't apply. Oh, he said, oh, no, that's not possible. I said, no, it's working, it's working. Oh, oh no, you, you misunderstand. And he just wouldn't talk with me about it anymore. <laughs> I don't think he ever caught on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was another famous scientist, uh, John von Neumann. I met at a cocktail party. He said, what are you doing? I told him we had this very pure frequency. Oh, oh, oh no, no, that's not possible. You know, you're, you're not measuring it right. You're not measuring it right. You're doing this and that. Oh, yeah, I said, no, 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 no. Well, well, he went off and got another cocktail, and about 15 minutes later, he came back. Hey, you're right, Ted. Tell me more about it. <laughs> he suddenly recognized it. Well, the collection of molecules, you get uh, much higher precision. So, to see, new ideas are new, and uh, many people are kind of cast off new ideas, especially if they're not, not their new ideas. Uh, now, um, as I say, the, the MESA was uh, very exciting for a long time, lots of people working on it, and uh, uh, nobody thought it could get the shorter wavelengths, but that's what I had wanted to do. I primarily wanted to get the shorter wavelengths. After about two or three years of the MESA, I decided, well, I'm going to sit down and see how to get the shorter wavelengths. So that's what I really want. Uh, to get amplifiers at short wavelengths and oscillators at short 